Okay, it's time for chapter three. It's called Dawn Escape. <clears throat> Funnily enough, it was Stella who had trouble sleeping that night. Tom, in his room next door, was out like a light the moment his head touched the pillow. A boat, Stella whispered repeatedly. How on earth could it have gotten there? And why was Harry soaked to the skin? She was thinking how first thing tomorrow they would have a good scout around in the bushes when a hollow clank from somewhere outside made her sit up. The clock at her bedside read 5 a.m. She must have fallen asleep. Still thinking about Harry, she crept from her bed to her window. The sun hadn't risen and the garden was bathed in a gray early morning mist. Nothing. It must have been a dream. <clears throat> But then, as she was about to drop back the curtains, the clanking echoed again. Stella peered to the right in the direction it seemed to have come from. A high-pitched squeak, followed by another clank. Then, through the dim half-light, she spotted Harry, trotting across the lawn in the direction of the island. The clanking must have been him trying to nudge open Mrs. Moon's patio garden gate. Tom, quick! Wake up! Stella tugged violently at Tom's pajamas. What? Where's the mole? Get it off me! Oh, wake up, will you? Snella, Stella snapped in a whisper. Tom sat up in a damp sweat. He had been dreaming that a friendly mole had just started to attack him. What's going on? he mumbled, as his sister's face loomed in front of him in the dark. It's Harry! He's gone off again. I've just seen him. Tom immediately woke right up then and fell on the floor as he tried to jump out of bed in a hurry. Let's get after him, he squealed, diving for his dressing gown. <coughs> Moments later, they stood at the top of the hallway stairs. Quietly, mouthed Stella, glaring like a school teacher. Slowly, they crept down, then put on their trainers and slipped outside into the gray morning air. Come on, we haven't much time, she whispered. Stella grabbed Tom's hand, and together they raced across the damp grass toward the island, wearing only their pajamas, dressing gowns, and trainers. Now, dressing gowns are like a robe, and trainers are what we call tennis shoes. Drat, we've missed him, said Stella. They had hunted around the island for a good five minutes. All was still, and there was no sign of Harry but at least the log was still in place, which meant Charlie Green hadn't noticed their digging. We'll just have to come back and have a good look when it's light, she said with a sigh. They then squelched back across the lawn, their trainers soaked with early morning dew. It was about halfway back that something caught the corner of Tom's eye. He glanced to his right, and through the fading dawn mist, for a moment, he thought he saw a group of three or four moles scampering in a circle on the grass. But when he blinked, they had gone. The half-light was playing tricks on him. Cold and shivering, they returned to their beds and slept soundly. The ring of the telephone shattered the early morning calm. Hello. Oh no, Mrs. Moon, not again. I am sorry. Yes, of course we'll let you know if we see him. Of course. We'll call you right away. Goodbye, Mrs. Moon. As they lay in their separate bedrooms, Tom and Stella listened to their mother's conversation. Each thinking about their earlier jaunt really hadn't been a dream after all, and how, after breakfast, they must continue their search for Harry. Chapter 4. The Secret Lake by 10 o'clock, Tom and Stella were back at the mound, complete with picnic lunch boxes. Stella, who was plugged into her iPhone music as usual, had brought a pocket torch, that means flashlight, for looking inside the bushes. For the first time in three weeks, she had also had a broad smile on her face. Tom had his red birthday binoculars slung around his neck, his digging trowel in one hand, and his treasure rag stuffed in his pocket. Right, we're going to have a good look inside this bush, said Stella. She got down and crawled on all fours into the rhododendron bush that Harry had quickly 
appeared from the morning before. Tom quickly surveyed the garden with his binoculars to see if Charlie Green was about. Coast is clear. Coming in, he shouted, but then immediately spotted something moving in the shade of one of the distant trees. Were those moles again? He refocused the binoculars to get a better look, but there was nothing there. I think I'm going bonkers, he mumbled under his breath. Then he scrambled in after his sister, yelling ouch every few seconds as the binoculars thumped against his knees. Tom, be quiet, snarled Stella after the fourth ouch. Do you want someone to hear us? So can you imagine what they're doing? They're crawling into this big mass of bushes. And so they have to get on their hands and knees and crawl in and they're just kind of trying to get through the bushes because that's where Harry had came out of earlier yesterday. As they crawled deeper inside the thicket, she switched on her tiny torch, that means flashlight, which shone a narrow beam of light ahead through the dark. Nothing, only twigs, more twigs, green leaves, dead leaves, rotten flower heads, and ugh, creepy crawlies scuttling back and forth across the undergrowth. The leaves brushing on Stella's hair suddenly gave her the shivers. There's nothing here, Tom, she said, dusting, dusting imaginary beetles from the top of her head. Let's go back. Tom had just begun to maneuver himself round on the spot, twigs scratching at him from all the sides, when his right arm slipped down a hole so deep that on one side, he was suddenly up to his shoulder in undergrowth. Hey, he bellowed, I found a hole. Stella quickly crawled over and pulled him up, then pointed her torch to investigate. The hole was far wider than either of them can believe. Yikes, Tom, lucky you didn't fall in, she whispered. Stella shone the torch down into the darkness. Well, it's too big for a rabbit hole, she said, flicking the beam of light up and down the inside wall. Look, shrieked Tom, so suddenly that they both crashed backwards into the undergrowth. Stella sighed angrily, then leaned forward and held the beam of light still against the earth wall. To her astonishment, she could clearly see what Tom had spotted, and she had nearly missed a rusty metal ladder fixed against the earthen wall and leading down into the hole. Shall we go down? said Tom, after they, had, after they had both stared at the ladder for a minute. Stella didn't answer. Instead, she took out a lime green polo candy. Do you think the boat would fit down there? she suddenly said. They both stared at the hole again. You're crazy, said Tom. Stella popped the polo into her mouth and grinned as her ears started tingling. Well then, I suppose we'll just have to go down on our own, won't we? So y'all, they're crawling in the bushes. They find a huge hole that Tom almost fall, fell down, by the way. And they notice that there's a rusty ladder going down into the hole. And they're about to go down it. Being the oldest and the largest, Stella went first, grasping lightly onto the rusty rungs and holding her torch between her teeth. Tom followed, awkwardly crutching, excuse me, clutching his trowel and not daring to look down. His binoculars were slung across him like a satchel. You okay, Tom? Stella's strange whisper, on account of the torch in her mouth, echoed eerily up the hole like a toothless ghost's. Fine, he lied in a squeak. Stella had been counting each step as she descended. When she reached 18, she stopped, took the torch from her mouth, and called up. Hey, Tom, I've just realized Harry wouldn't have been able to get down here on his own. That's what I was just thinking, said Tom. Weird. Stella, meanwhile, had dangled one foot down, but she couldn't feel any more rungs below her. 
I think we've reached the end, she called out, continuing to splay her leg out in the tar darkness like a tentacle. Suddenly, her foot hit something hard and wide that she was able to rest on. She pointed her torch down. A tiny beam of light bounced off what looked like the branch of a tree. And then she saw that the wall of the tunnel below the last rung was no longer earthen. It looked like tree bark. Tom, I think we found an underground tree, she yelled. Carefully, she let go of the last rung of the ladder and grasped a couple of short nodules that were sticking out like a giant nail heads from the bark. Dangling one of her feet still lower, she found another branch to rest on. Soon she discovered there were nodules protruding from all over the place between the branches, making it easy to climb down. Follow me, it's okay, she called. Neither of them had noticed, but the surrounding darkness was turning dim gray. After they had descended a little farther, Stella stopped. I don't believe this, Tom. We're coming to the outside, she shrieked. A pool of light was shining up from below, and as they continued descending, daylight began to surround them. Are we in Australia? shouted Tom hopefully. No idea shouted Stella, who could now hear birds singing. The branches now began thinning out, and soon there were only the nodules of the tree trunk left to step and grasp onto. The sun-drenched grass below looked so soft, Stella jumped the final couple of meters down. Then, as she raised herself from the ground, brushing earth and tiny stones from her knees, she looked up to see the most beautiful lake, surrounded by crimson, pink, flowering bushes stretching away in front of her. Thud. Tom, complete with binoculars and trowel, landed beside her. Told you there was water nearby, said Stella triumphantly, pointing at the lake. Tom, still breathless, clapped his binoculars to his eyes. Where on earth are we? he whispered, scanning from left to right, trying to see beyond the trees on the far side. Suddenly, he fixed on something moving on the lake. Look at that, Stell. My goodness, she murmured. About halfway across the lake, a boy in a small bo boat was rowing frantically in their direction. Stella snatched the binoculars from Tom to get a closer look almost throttling him. The boy in the boat didn't seem didn't see them at first because his back was square onto them as he rode. However, as he drew closer, he turned and spotted them. As soon as he hit the bank, he clambered out and began to pull the boat high up in the direction of the tree. Give a hand with this, will you? Tom and Stella, who had only been able to stand and gape, suddenly stepped forward and helped him pull the boat right up under the tree. They were speechless, and all the time they couldn't take their eyes off his dirt-smudged face, his ragged brown suit with half-length trousers, and his filthy lace-up ankle boots. Nah, don't you go telling on me, will you? You never saw me, right? He growled. Despite his snarl, the boy looked terrified. Stella and Tom shook their heads, then stood in silence as he dashed into the woodland behind him. Where did he come from? whispered Tom. More to the point, where is he going? said Stella. Did you see the clothes he was wearing? Tom started laughing. Stella, meanwhile, was staring out across the lake to the far bank in front of the woods, where there was a little opening. Quick! Give me those binoculars back. Tom passed them over and Stella clapped them to her eyes. What is it? Oh no, it's nothing, Stella said vacantly. But then as she passed the binoculars back, she squinted across the lake again. Funny though, I could have sworn I saw some moles just then. Moles don't come out in daytime, silly, said Tom. 
Trees don't go, grow underground, retorted Stella. Now come on, let's row over. That's the end of the chapter. So, they go down a hole, down to the ground. They reach a tree, they climb down the tree, and it's daylight, and they're in some place with a lake. And they just met a strange boy who ran away. They're seeing moles here and there that they can't see another second later. And now they're about to go get in a boat and row across. So we've got a very mysterious story here on our hands.